Okay, hello everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. And today I'm continuing my conversations with Brother Jason Jack. And we're doing a series called 101 Verses Proving Faith Alone. And we're about two thirds of the way uh, discussing all these 101 verses. Uh, so we're going to pick up today where we left off last time. But <laughs> I'm just glad we're here, brother. We had the technical problem. I don't know how you fixed it, but it worked. I <laughs> uh, no, I'm not very good at this technical stuff. Yeah, well, but hopefully, after, after you two remember, hours, maybe you'll be able to remember what you did next time we uh, do one, and, and we'll see. Okay, are you ready for the first verse? Yep. This is Acts 26, verse 18. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. This is... Um... Paul speaking to um, King Agrippa and basically starts in verse 14 by quoting the words of Jesus when um, he was Saul and, um, you know, he saw Jesus on the road to Damascus. And that's what uh, he's quoting here, just looking at verse 18. This is actually Jesus speaking, and Paul is quoting what Jesus said. Um, to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light. We see that a lot. Um, you know, Jesus is the light, and he's the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world, as I like to say in John 1.9. Uh, and uh, we receive forgiveness of our sins through him, and we receive God's inheritance through him. And we become sanctified through him. And this is positionally sanctified, not that our flesh is being actively sanctified. Now, we can become more sanctified, but we'll never reach that, that pure sanctification uh, in this mortal flesh ever. It will be at the redemption of our body uh, where we receive a spiritual body to those believers. Um, but the whole reason that this verse is in this list of 101 verses is the last five words of it faith that is in me that's how you receive forgiveness of sins that's how you receive the, the inheritance uh that's how you receive sanctification um it's faith in jesus that's what paul's saying and, and trying to relate um to all that were listening um including king agrippa well, I would say you said the last five words, but I, I would say it's the last six words because that word by is uh, an important part of that point. It says by faith that is in me. We could even say seven words, sanctified by faith that is in me. And we talked about uh some of these words that we come across quite often in the bible sanctified justified you know, uh, salvation redemption uh reconciliation uh they're all kind of related they don't all have exactly the same meaning but we we concluded that sanctified means that you're declared holy and righteous and you're set apart so in other words when we put our faith in jesus uh we are spiritually set in picked up and moved into this camp, a group of people <laughs> uh, that, that are called saints, and uh, God says, we're holy, we're righteous, okay? Uh, and and that, that happens at the moment we believe. It's uh, sanctified and justified. Of course, justified means that uh, God says uh, that uh, I see you just as if you'd never sinned, just if I'd, just if I'd never sinned. Uh, so uh, all that happens at the moment of faith, it's an event. It's not a process that we have to work at over our lifetime. 
Um, so this says that we're sanctified, that means we're set apart and declared holy and righteous uh, by faith that is in me, and that is Jesus. Now, the rest of the verse, uh, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, uh, you, that's not really the main uh, point that we want to talk about in this, uh, in this particular subject, uh, 101 verses proving faith alone. I think the main thing about this verse is that it says that we are sanctified by faith that is in me, and, and it, do, it doesn't say you're sanctified by faith that is, in, that is in me as long as you repent of your sins and get baptized and circumcised and so on. It doesn't say that, anything else. It just, period. You notice there's a period that says after that by, by faith that is in me, period? Right. Wow. I guess Luke, and Luke uh, according to Lordship Salvation, Luke must have been a heretic because he put a period there. He should have put, continued on saying all the other things that are required for someone to be sanctified. <laughs> okay. Uh, let me look at that. Uh, let me see. I've got so many things up now uh, here uh, as far as programs running. I hope it doesn't affect my speed and mess me up in any way. But uh, I want to look at this page here to see there's a chat room. So I, I have actually am looking at my chat room now, and I'm not seeing anybody. Is anybody watching this? Let's see. Okay, we have zero viewers, so obviously there's nobody, you know, in the chat room and making questions. But I'll keep an eye on that now because I, I found a way of accessing that while we're talking. Uh, so are you ready to go on to the next verse? Uh, anything else uh, need to be said about this one? No, I think we can go on. Okay, so the next one is Hebrews 7.25. Let's see. Let me find that in. Oh, gosh. Oh, there. No? My Bible Gateway program here, I'm not finding it. Uh, well, let me see. I guess I'm going to have to pull it up. Gosh, I've got so many things minimized now. <laughs> I don't know how I lost the Bible Gateway program. Let me see. Control V, enter. Okay. All right, so here it is in the KJV. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. And obviously this is talking about Jesus Christ, and this is a comparison of uh, the law, the Old Testament, um, and the New Covenant made the better testament, as it says in verse 22, um, through Jesus Christ, and specifically through um, his blood, the redemption, through his blood. And, you know, the... Again, the, the point here is we come unto God by him. It, you know, that's the key here. It's by him um, through Jesus. There's no other way. You know, Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Um, and he saves them. He, say, he saves whoever, whosoever will. Um, you know, freely receive Jesus. He receives him to the uttermost. Um, you know, that's the uttermost. That's like the, the most extreme, the highest you can receive somebody. That's how he receives us. Um, and he does this forever because Jesus is God. He lives forever. He's the Alpha and Omega. Uh, so he's always made intercess intercession for um for those that believe in him and you know we see this a lot we see um in in hebrews we see that he's the intercessor he's the mediator uh of the new testament uh, you know an intercessor and mediate 
mediation are very similar terms. You know, it's a, the act of intervening on behalf of someone else. And that's what Jesus does for us. Um, you know, we're dead in our sins. We can't do anything um, through our efforts, through our works to receive the free gift of eternal life. But we don't have to. We simply trust in Jesus' finished work on the cross and he intervenes for us. He becomes our intercessor, our mediator um, of God's promises. And, and that's what this is saying. But I, I love this verse because, um, you know, it, it's, it signals that to come into God, you come through Jesus Christ. And that once you place your faith in Jesus Christ, it's forever. He lives forever to make intercession. So he's never going to stop once you come to him. Um, and the uttermost, you know, the most extreme, the highest um, that you could be saved, he saves you. Yeah, I, this is a fantastic verse. Um, and the word uttermost, you know, how often do you hear the word uttermost today? Um, but it's a great word uh, telling us that you couldn't be saved any more than that. It, it, there's, it's impossible to, to get, be saved any more than saved to the uttermost. <laughs> you know, it's 100%, not 90% or 95% or 99%. There's no slight area where you're not completely saved. And so that is just reassuring. And if you're saved completely, a hundred percent to the uttermost couldn't be saved anymore then that should give us that great blessed assurance and the peace and joy that comes with that uh, but I, I like the way this expresses it it says save them to the uttermost that come unto God so we come to God here's a picture we're coming to God by him seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them so the way I kind of visualize this is that here's a, Jesus, I, I need you to be my savior, and he embraces me and takes my hand. And he's, oops, I can't see him. He, Jesus got me by the hand, and he walks me over here, pres presents me to the Father and says, he's with me. He's mine. <laughs> he's coming. He, he takes me right into heaven. Uh, that's kind of how I visualize this kind of a process, the thing that happens. Yeah, once you grab his mighty right hand, he won't let go. Um, and, you know, I, I guess we don't say uttermost now. We say utmost. Um, most people still don't say utmost, but um, we get the picture with this, with this uh, wording here um, about the forever nature of Jesus Christ being our, our intercessor um, mm -hmm. to the Father through faith. Okay, I'm going to read this in the Amplified. Oh, I just had it there. Um, it says, therefore, let me let me just post it. Control C. I'll post it in this chat area so you can see it too. Okay. okay. It says, therefore, he is able to save completely. So our explanation of uttermost uh, in today's language, and, and it simply stated, I think completely is, is the right word there. Those who come to God through him, through Jesus. So there is no other way. You cannot get to God unless you get there through Jesus. He's the one that has to take you to the Father, and he says, look, he's got my righteousness. Uh, because he always lives to intercede for them. So he's interceding for us. He has interceded for us and uh, always will. Okay. Any more on that? Um, I just want to read Hebrews 9.15. I don't know if that's in one of the verses coming up uh, in this list, but, you know, I mentioned mediator and intercessor being very similar uh, in Hebrews 9.15, it says, And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. 
So again, it's the same thought process that I think Paul who wrote uh, Hebrews uh, is relating to um, the Hebrews in, in this epistle. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I, I agree. Uh, it's, it's interesting how uh, there's not uh, unanimity on uh, the author of uh, Hebrews. Uh, to me, it, it seems pretty apparent, uh, but uh, I've heard other theories. Uh, the one that I've heard mentioned is it was Apollo. So I don't know why they would assume Apollo wrote it, but uh, that's the only name I've, I've ever heard as a possible author. Uh, but I think uh, Hebrews is, is, is um, written by Paul because I see Hebrews kind of as a sequel to Galatians. Uh, Galatians, the whole point is pointing out that there's these false teachers that are coming into the churches that Paul established and, and uh, bringing in apostasy and false doctrines and damnable heresies. And so Paul's addressing that. He says that they're trying to say you got to be a Jew and to be a Christian, say you got to adopt all these Judaism, circumcision, the Sabbath, the dietary laws, all these things. And uh, Paul says, you got to keep that separate. That's not part of this. And, uh, and then in Hebrews, of course, is the same point is being made, except it's specifically talking about uh, temple worship and animal sacrifices. You have to stop that. You cannot continue doing all these uh, 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 practices of Judaism. Uh, to me, that's the great um, thing that uh, happened in the, it, it, it took, uh, I would say probably, uh, it was a 10 years before they even realized the Gentiles could be in the church. From the time of Pentecost until the conversion of Cornelius, the first Gentile believer, that was 10 years. Uh, and then it was... Uh, uh, another 10 years before Paul was doing his missionary journeys. So um, really, it took quite a long time for them to um, reach the point where what we believe, that the Bible says they, they thought that uh, Jesus came just to save Israel and the Jews. And then they finally realized that, no, he came to save the world, Jews and Gentiles both. They thought that you had to be a practice Judaism and believe in Jesus, but then we realized, no, you, you can't mix religion and works, even if it's Judy, the works of Judaism, you can't mix it with faith in Jesus. You have to leave that behind too. Uh, it took really probably a couple of decades for them to really work all that out and, and um, get to the point where, uh, okay, this is not a Jewish thing. Uh, you know, Jesus was a Jew, and the Judaism and all that pointed to Jesus, but you can't hold on to it. You have to discard Judaism. And so I, all that being said, because we're talking about the book of Hebrews, <laughs> and I think that that's the main point of the book of Hebrews, is that you get to get rid of these ideas of Judaism. And what they were doing at that time, actually, was you had the, it says the 12 tribes of uh um, yeah, uh, no, it's, that's James. It says the book of Hebrews. So it's written to Hebrew believers. And why? Because these Hebrew believers uh, at that time began to be persecuted because they weren't doing the temple worship and the animal sacrifices. So to avoid the persecution, they were compromising. And even though they believed in Jesus, they were started going back and started doing all those things. So I think Paul reprimanded them and, 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 and took a stand and said, you, Jesus died once for all. It's, per, it's done. No more deaths with animals. Uh, that was just pointing to, to Jesus. Um, so um, uh, that's uh, the whole point of the book of, of um, Hebrews. And that's why I think Paul wrote it because, it just as I said, I'm just repeating myself now. Pardon me. Um, therefore, oops. Do we go on to the next verse? Because I uh, uh, I forgot where I am. I, I wanted such a tirade there. <laughs> no, we finished up um, Hebrews 7. We were talking about Hebrews 7.25. And then I, I talked about Hebrews 9.15. But... Oh, all right. Yeah, that's why you brought up another Hebrews book. Yeah. 
point. So that's what got me started on that. See what happens when you, you, you press one of my buttons, brother? <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, before I go to the next verse, do you want to say anything about my comment? Um, no, I think that's well said. You know, Hebrews is, is um, a great book on um, about turning from, you know, turning from dead works to faith unto God. And like you said, you know, Galatians does the same thing. People were coming in in the church of Galatia trying to bring in um, the bondage of the law to new believers. And Paul's message was, you know, don't let anything be added to the true gospel of Jesus Christ or it's an accursed gospel. Anything that you add to it, such as circumcision um, in the book of Galatians is, is one of the um, mentions of what what um, these people are trying to bring into the church. Uh, and in Hebrews, you know, um, there are a lot of Hebrew servants of the law still that the law had never, had not got them yet as the schoolmaster to their faith, to put their faith in Jesus Christ, but it had others. And all these people were, you know, these Hebrew believers and non-believers were all together and the unbelievers were trying to get the believers back under the law and they weren't sure, like you said, uh, what to do. So, you know, again, I think Paul uh, is writing uh, to them to say, you know, don't get back under the law. The, the law's never saved you. Um, you know, you have a better sacrifice, uh, Jesus Christ, the perfect sacrifice. Um, and so that's what, you know, all these chapters are leading up to. And then, you know, as we see in um, the latter chapters in specifically six through 10, we really see him hammer that home. Mm -hmm. So the next verse is uh, Romans 3.10. And it's, it's even only a, like a, a partial sentence, a little piece of a sentence here. And it says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. And, uh, okay, go, go first. Yeah, we can, and did you see that the next verse 71 is Romans 3.12? which basically is a repeat of the same phrase, you know, quoting Psalm 14. So we could probably just put these all together and, um, and hit two verses together. Do you see that? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, let me put that there. I'll paste that. So I'll read it while you're putting that up there in Romans 3.10. And I'll just read Romans 3, 10, 11, and 12. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. And this is uh, Paul quoting Psalm 14, which starts out, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God but then goes on um, to say there's none that doeth good, no, not one. And so, you know, this is the beginning of Romans Road. And, you know, Romans Road being a way to share the gospel with others um, and point to Jesus Christ as our Savior and his death, burial, resurrection on the cross and how to receive that through faith. Um, as, as we know in Romans 10, but, um, you know, Romans three begins that road that we must first understand that we're sinners we need a savior. And this is a great couple of verses to point that out. Um, Romans three 23 later on in this chapter also being another one of those verses for all have sin and come short of the glory of God. Um, so when I've taught to people, I think, I don't know of anybody that has ever said that they have no sin before, <laughs> before receiving salvation. Now I know a lot of self-righteous people that think that they have uh, sinless perfection afterwards and, and they're not righteous either when they're trusting in their own words. I think, 
you know, this verse apply is very applicable to, to share others, um, to begin that gospel with others to, to show why we need a savior, um, that we're not righteous and, and that we have broken God's spiritual laws and the wages of breaking those spiritual laws is death and specifically the second death, uh, spiritual death. Um, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So I think most people understand this. Here's the thing I have a problem with on some of the soul winning that I see is, and I'll just point like Ray Comfort, for instance, who teaches this Lordship salvation. Um, he will, he does a very good job of pointing this out that the person that he is trying to share the gospel, even though it's a false gospel, he points out all their transgressions, that they are a liar, that they're a thief, adulterer at heart, you know, um, and instead of just doing that for a second, because most people, like I said, 99.999% of people understand that they're a sinner. I uh, really don't have to go over that that much, but he stays on it and he says, well, you're a sinner. Now you have to repent of those sins and turn from all those sins and turn from being a liar and turn from being a thief and turn from being an adulterer heart. So he never uses the law properly. He, he uses the law improperly. He uses it to get them under the bondage of the law instead of using it to point them to Jesus Christ. He, he's trying to show people that they, once they believe in Jesus Christ, that they can uphold the law and that's part of salvation. But the law was placed to show that we couldn't uphold it and we needed a savior who fulfilled it perfectly in Jesus Christ. Um, so these verses, I think probably, <laughs> especially in, in the 21st century where we see so many accursed gospels on every church, um, you know, in, in every city, on, on many, in many churches that are teaching this repent of your sins um, for salvation, heresy. I think that these verses are applicable for, for them, those who think that they have turned from all their sins and that's part of salvation. We need to point them back to these verses say, no, you're still, there's no sinless perfection. Um, you haven't reached holiness. Um, there's no one righteous, no, not one, including you still. Uh, the only way that we can be saved is not by works of righteousness we have done, but according to his mercy, he saves us. We, we receive Jesus Christ's righteousness through faith. Um, and he imputes his righteousness unto our account. Again, he's our intercessor, our mediator uh, in doing that um, before the Heavenly Father. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that the, uh, the word good, you'd think that uh, it would be a really simple thing to, uh, when the Bible says no one is good, um, it shouldn't be so hard to understand and it's so hard to accept i don't think but but i've i've used that verse hundreds of times in my witnessing with people and um because if you ask people if they're going to go to heaven and why almost everybody pleads their case based upon their their goodness i i think i'm a pretty good person you know uh but when i say well but the bible says no one is good not even one and they, they can't accept that because they look at people and they judge everybody and based upon what I would call relative goodness. Uh, if we were to compare everybody we know, we could probably form a, a ranking list and say, this is the best person I know and the second best, this is the worst and, you know, rank them in goodness and badness, you know, uh, but what, what Jesus says, no one is good. He said to the rich young ruler, uh, who said, he said to Jesus, my, my good uh, master. And Jesus said, well, why do you call me good? No one is good but God. So the, the rich young ruler 
could have said, well, I believe you're God, uh, you know, but what he was doing, he didn't believe he was God, number one, and number two, he was using good very casually, not understanding the true meaning of the word good, and that's why he said, no one is good, only God is good, and to me, it's it's really obvious, and I, I, I don't know why uh, uh, other people haven't seen this, and I, I'm, I hate to sound egotistical, but God is spelled G-O-D. Good is spelled G-O-O-D. It's the same word, really. Only God is good. The only one good is God. So God is good. Good is God. And uh, so if you say you're good, you have to be God. Because good means perfect, really. When Jesus is talking about no one is good, no one is perfect. He said, go and be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And, uh, and to show them the foolishness of that way of thinking. Uh, so if we really understand that good means perfect and that no one is good, and the standard you have to meet is perfection, and the Bible says on this Romans road, there's a verse that says, we all fall short of the glory of God. So if we say that the glory of God is uh, 100% good, perfect, pure, and Jesus is the glory of God, Jesus set the standard. We all fall short. We all have varying degrees of goodness and badness, but we all, the best of men, the best of righteousness of man is like filthy rags in the sight of God. So our goodness is like disgustingly bad compared to Jesus. And uh, when we understand that, then we can realize that, wait a second, our, the, the idea that we could possibly go to God and think that we deserve heaven because of our goodness, that should shut their mouth right there. They should, let's get that thought right out of your head. Don't even think it's uh, in the realm of possibility that you could ever go before God and say, let me into heaven because I deserve it. I'm, I'm good enough. No, no one is good. No one is righteous, not even one. And so what are you going to do? And uh, Jesus, the things that he said were hyperbole to try to make us understand that it's impossible. If you, okay, you think you can do it? Then cut out your hand. Gouge out your eye. Go and be perfect. And uh, they, the apostle said, well, Lord, based on what you're telling us, how can, how is it possible, is the exact phrase, how is it possible for anyone to get saved? That's what the apostle said to Jesus at that point. They're, they're, they're throwing up their hands and just saying, I get it. I, how is it possible then? How could we ever get saved then if, if you're expecting this from us? And he said, with man, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And so that's, and, and the point, that's the same thing that Paul, technique that Paul used, using the law to, he called him the schoolmaster, to bring us to Christ. Schoolmaster means it, the law teaches you the impossibility of earning your salvation. And so to me, that's the main thing on this verse here. This verse and the next one, they are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. So foolish man, just dismiss the thought. Don't ever even let it enter your mind that there's the possibility that you could be good enough to go to heaven on your own merit. All right, brother. Uh, yeah. And, next, and go ahead. You mentioned, um, you know, the rich man um, asking, um, you know, asking Jesus about, you know, how to be saved basically. And, and, you know, address him as good master. And Jesus says, why callest thou me good? There's none good, but one that's God. So, you know, either Jesus is saying he's not good or he's saying he's God. And we know that we know the answer to that question. Um, but another thing within that verse or that passage, and it's in Matthew 19, I just pulled it up. Um, you know, Jesus is just pressing this, this, guy you know who thinks he is keeping all the commandments 
Um, so he's he's Jesus is telling him some of the major commandments, you know, and the Ten Commandments, and um, and the young man, you know, the rich young man says, "Oh, I, I've done that since my youth." Um, so Jesus is just going to keep going <laughs> uh, until um, he either makes his point to the young person that the, the young rich ruler that no matter what he does, it's not going to be good enough. Um, and that he needs to have faith in him or like the young rich man, he walked away disappointed because he had much riches. He, he didn't get it. Um, and a lot of people still don't get this passage. Um, they will look at this passage and, and teach a workspace salvation. Uh, and, and, and say, well, if he would have just, um, given up his riches and followed Jesus, that would have proved he was saved, but that wasn't Jesus's point at all. If, if, if he would have, if the rich young ruler would have said he was going to do that, Jesus just would have added something else until, um, until he proved that he's not perfect. Um, and so I just want to make that point in in that passage in Matthew 19. And just think of the absurdity of the rich young ruler saying, I followed all of these things since my youth. He actually was deluded enough to think that, that he had really followed the law perfectly and, and there was no fault in him. And that's why Jesus had to ratchet it, ratchet it, ratchet it down. So you say that you haven't committed adultery? Well, if you ever looked at someone and lust, you're guilty of adultery in your heart. You know, he had to ratchet down so tight that there was no way, no wiggle room. They couldn't get out of it. They're convicted. You're guilty. You're not perfect. You need to be saved. Exactly. And, you know, I don't think that anybody, um, when Jesus says, thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You know, Jesus earlier in the Beatitudes shows how difficult that was, uh, you know, because, um, you know, you may not have actively committed that of adultery, but if you look on somebody, then you commit adultery in your heart. And the same thing about murder, you know, being uh, hating your brother. Um, and, you know, there's there's so many hypocrites today that get on Facebook and say, I love everybody, you know, this or that. There's not one person that loves thy neighbor as thyself probably on a daily basis. I, I would, I would venture to say that in our hearts from a spiritual standpoint, every person alive today breaks one of these commandments from a spiritual standpoint on a daily basis. Uh, so we have to realize, um, you know, although we think that we are a good person and righteous from God's standpoint, there's no one righteous. Um, and we have to, you know, humble our hearts and understand that that's what God wants. He doesn't want a prideful heart because he knows that a prideful heart is going to be less apt to accept um, the truths of the Bible, accept uh, Jesus as their savior. Um, because they're trusting in themselves and the things that they possess. And, and that's what Matthew 19 is about. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the next one uh, is uh, the same point. Uh, uh, Ecclesiastes, there is not a just man upon earth that doeth good. Uh, they're all, these are all ways of really making the same point. So I don't know how much we need to cover that verse. There are various ways of saying the same thing. Get it through your thick skull. Don't even imagine that you could ever go to the judgment and think you're good enough to get into heaven. No one is good. You think you've done good? No one's done any good in the sight of God. Your best thing is filthy rags. That's what God thinks of your personal merit. So um, these verses are all really uh, various ways of, and it's, it, look, it's that's Ecclesiastes. So it's it's all over the Bible at this point. You know, as you said, the first one was uh, taken from Psalm, right? There's right. Yeah. Not one. Yeah, and this is this is um, 
Ecclesiastes um, from Solomon, right? Mm -hmm. David's son. So David, you know, wrote the wrote the Psalms and sang the Psalms, played the Psalms. Uh, and I'm sure Solomon heard Psalm 14, uh, that no one's righteous, no, not one. Uh, and as Solomon got older, he got into a lot of unrighteousness. And, you know, Ecclesiastes is, is part of um, his looking back on his life and realizing just how wretched man is, you know, mortal man is. Uh, I'm sure that's why he wrote Ecclesiastes 7.20, and that was a thousand years prior to, um, you know, Paul writing that in the book of Romans. Uh, 972 years earlier. <laughs> I just made that up. I'm just kidding. Oh, you're um, probably right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the next one is Romans 4.25. Who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. All right, I'm pulling this up. We're on rapid speed today. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, okay. So Romans 425. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm just reading the verse before. Um, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Uh, so verse 25 shows Jesus Christ, his death, basically his death, burial, and resurrection, the gospel, you know, that, um, you know, according to scripture, he, he was died and, and was buried and rose again on the third day. Uh, and this is pointing that out um, through New Testament scripture. And the reason that he, that Jesus died on the cross is to be our deliverer uh, for our offenses, for transgressing uh, the law. And, um, and then the part, a part of that is through the resurrection. That's how he overcame death for us. And, and we become part of that resurrection uh, we're crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, we live uh, and become part of that re resurrection through faith. Um, and again, we're declared just. Uh, it's not that we are completely in this mortal body justified. We're still, you know, mortal flesh that will continue to sin. Although, um, you know, we strive to be pleasing to God and be as good a disciple and do our reasonable service and, and all those things. And with spiritual maturity, you begin to walk more and more uh, looking forward, you know, in, in the spirit, not looking, looking back and, and with the lust of the flesh, but there's a constant battle, um, you know, as, as Paul mentions in the book of Romans. Um, but the, um, the death, burial, and resurrection right here is the is what's pointed out in verse twenty five, and verse twenty four shows the how to receive um, the gospel, how to receive the good news of Jesus Christ, and and the promises of Jesus Christ through Jesus Christ, and that's believing on Him. Um, so mm -hmm. that's it for for me on this verse. Uh, the, the earlier verses, uh, one after the next, uh, was driving home the point to make it clear to everyone that um, you've got to admit, you need, you need to realize and admit that you're in a helpless situation. There's nothing you can do. You can't help yourself out of this. Recognize, feel, God, I have no hope. I have no hope. It's a helpless, hopeless situation for all of mankind. Uh, and I don't know if there's this TV show I've watched a few times over the years. It was just too depressing. It's called Intervention. Where it's real sad. People who are 
alcoholics and drug addicts and stuff there and their families have an intervention and try to rescue the person and, and pull them out of their addiction and help them and stuff and they um, that's God God loves us so much that he intervened realizing that man's situation is hopeless there's nothing he can do he could never be perfect on his own so he loves us so much God intervened God came down from heaven God manifested in the flesh as the Son of God. He became a man. Jesus said, do not think I came to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. So he had to become a man in order to die. He had to die as a ransom. A ransom is a payment made to someone to set someone else free. So we need to understand our situation is helpless and hopeless. And that, that makes us realize we need to call on the name of the Lord. We need to do what the uh, uh, publican did in front of the temple. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. He recognized, I'm just a sinner. I'm there, I'm there, there's no hope. God, have mercy on me. And now we realize the God that will, can have mercy and save us is Jesus Christ. God manifest in the flesh. So we call on the name of the Lord once we realize that we need him. We can't, that's why you talked about that way of the master and great comfort and all that, that, you know, they, they, their process is let's convict people, make them understand they're guilty, and then they need to be uh, saved by Jesus. But then the problem is they say Jesus is death and, uh, for your sins. It's not enough. You've got to make a commitment to stop sinning, and you better stop. You know, otherwise, you know, Jesus did his part, but you didn't quit sinning. So that's why they ruin it, just like in, uh, when Paul says that, uh, you know, it's grace is no more grace if you add works to it. You, you've made the cross of none effect if you add any works to it, and if you add personal merit. So these verses should convict us, make us feel helpless. Then we call on the name of the Lord, and this verse is telling us what he did. Jesus was delivered for our offenses, for our sins, he was delivered. He was taken to that cross. Now, he could have just said, uh, like he did in the garden, when he, what did he say? What was the word he said when they fell backwards? Uh, was did he say, I am? He says, who is Jesus? And he, he said, I am, or something. Maybe you can remember exactly what he said, that they fell back. Just, he could just speak. And mm -hmm. all the... The, the, set, the, the, the Pharisees and the Roman guards, all that, they could have just fallen and turned to stone or anything. It just, he could have stopped it like that. But he, he willingly, voluntarily went to suffer and die because he knew that that was necessary to save us. Uh, so this death, we need to understand that our sins caused this barrier between man and God. There was a separation man could not have a relationship because sin was the barrier and then jesus died for our sin now the sin barrier is removed and the pit the, the temple the bible says that when jesus died on the cross the temple uh the curtain in the temple that separated the open the public area from the the holy of holies where only the high priest could go back once a year and he risked his life even going back there uh that 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 was a picture of the separation between man and God. Be, be separate. It was sin that was the barrier. Well, the curtain at Jesus' death was torn open from top to bottom, showing us that the barrier is removed. Man is reconciled. God is not holding your sins against you anymore. Uh, and so you can have a relationship with God. But as it said in that first verse, you have to come to God. With Jesus Christ, you need to let him take your hand and say, here, he's mine. He's good. He is good. Because he has our goodness imputed to him. Now, the resurrection, uh, I've always thought when it says, raised again for our justification. Now, there's two ways of, of looking at this justification. I think probably... I'm, I'm, maybe I'm way off on this, but I think probably 99% of the people think that this word justification here means that our justification before God, so that God declares us justified. I think the cross is what does that. 
Uh, we, when, when they, you know, our sins are paid for. We put our faith in Jesus, and now we're justified. But the resurrection does not justify us before God. The resurrection, re resurrection justifies us in putting our faith in Jesus. You see, the, the, the apostles were hiding out for their lives after Jesus was crucified. They knew the Romans were going to come for them next. Watch the movie Risen. I did a, a movie review on it on one of my videos. It's fantastic. And you'll see it was really historically correct and fantastic, the detail that they went into. Uh, but these apostles were afraid for their lives. And they were cowardly, not willing to, you know, uh, suffer along with Jesus, not willing to suffer and then die after Jesus died, you know, for the cause. Um, and yet they turned into the boldest witnesses, almost all of them uh, suffering death in persecution later for their testimony about Jesus being risen. So Jesus said, when the Jews asked him, well, you know, you're making all these claims, you know, prove it, give us a sign. And Jesus said, the only sign I'm going to give you, after he's already done it, like a hundred miracles, <laughs> he says, the only sign I'm going to give you is the sign of Jonah. Just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, I think he was dead. So shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three dead days and three nights. And that, that scripture says he was referencing his death, burial, and resurrection. That was a picture of his death, burial, and resurrection, this illustration about Jonah and the whale. So for it to be a true analogy, Jesus was dead in the tomb. He wasn't like some people think Jonah was alive in the, in the, in the, in the, uh, in the whale. Well, then it wouldn't have been a true comparison unless Jonah was dead and was brought back to life. Um, so this resurrection is the sign that Jesus promised and he kept his promise. He's raised from the dead. He showed himself. Now, what happened to the apostles? They saw him. They touched him. They ate with him for 30 or 40 days, I think. And, and uh, after he ascended, they went off and all the, were the boldest witnesses and, and even suffering uh, death for their testimony, and, and all because of the resurrection. The resurrection is what justified their faith. They felt justified in, in relying and trusting Jesus because he proved it to them. Uh, so uh, that's how I see the word justified here. Uh, the resurrection justifies us putting our faith in Jesus. Now, I may be wrong, but uh, what's your thoughts on this? No, I love that. I, the last two or three minutes, I just felt like I learned more than last month I've gone to church. <laughs> I mean, that's really good. Um, because now I see it exactly how you see it. And I think that that's a incredible way of, of looking at that. Um, and then even going back to, to Jonah, um, I think that I, I was just, um, I was just really blown away by, by just that. I want to, did you do a video about that? About, What's that? about Jonah. Did you do a video where you talk about that? Uh, this is not the first time I've gone into that kind of an explanation on all these things, but I, I can't tell you exactly where it is on my, what video you'll find it. Well, that was I, really I, good. That was really good. And, 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 um, yeah, I think that, you know, by Jesus being resurrected and, and as you said, being with, showing himself to the apostles to over 500 at one time, um, you know, eating with them and drinking with them and, and, you know, and, and doing all these uh, things prior to his ascension. Uh, once they were persecuted, yeah, they, they, they were justified in their faith in him by um, his presenting them, uh, presenting them or presenting himself to them, uh, after his resurrection. Yeah, I think that's great. Mm -hmm. So it looks like we have about six minutes before our hour is up. So maybe this would be a good time for you to summarize. Uh, I don't know if we should take on another verse. What do you think? Yeah, we can summarize. We went through a good bit today. So 
Yeah, let me summarize. Uh, we started with Hebrew, or actually we started with um, Acts 26, 18, uh, discussing that it's Jesus Christ who forgives our sins. It's not by our efforts. Um, as uh, Paul was relating to King Agrippa, um, and you know, going back to that, he he almost that's one of the times where you see somebody almost become a Christian, but not quite. <laughs> you know, King Agrippa says, "You now almost had me to become a Christian." Uh, at the end of his, so you could tell this was a really powerful um, um, speech that Paul gave here in Acts 26, and um, you know maybe it planted that seed where King Agrippa didn't um, come to faith and put his faith in Jesus Christ at that point, but hopefully uh, in the future he did. We just don't know. Um, but then we go on to Hebrews 7:25, where Jesus is our intercessor. He lives forever uh, to be our intercessor. He saves us to the uttermost or the utmost. Um, and we come to God by him. Uh, so that was really the point there. And then we had three verses back to back to back showing that uh, no one's righteous. Um, no one is good in the eyes of God from a comparison standpoint to his perfectness. We're always going to fall short of the glory of God. Uh, and we need to understand that, you know, it's not our, it's not being a good person. It's not doing good works that, um, gets us to heaven. Um, that that's not how we achieve eternal life. And once we place our faith in Jesus Christ, we need to understand that it's his righteousness. It's his perfectness, his holiness that we're trusting in and not ours. Um, you know, like we talked about, you know, sometimes I think that, um, quote, Christians who um, are thinking that they're turning away from their sins and that's a part of salvation. You know, you see where they may have, well, God's done his part, you know, with Jesus Christ dying on the cross. But now we we still have to do our part. We have to turn from our sins and do all these sacraments and be water baptized and then be faithful to the end. You know, we need to show <laughs> these passages over and over. Yeah, you can do all that. Uh, you can quote, you know, be faithful into the end, but regardless, you sin every day and you're not good. No one is righteous compared to God's righteousness. Um, and, and get, somebody that may be mixed up in this Lordship salvation, false gospel heresy to get them from looking at themselves and what they're doing and looking at others and comparing themselves to how um, others live and either um, getting them to strive to live better or puffing them up in pride because they think in their mind they are living better and that they're saved because of their efforts. Uh, and, and, you know, sort of knock them off their high horse and, and say, you know, quit looking at yourself. Uh, when it comes to salvation, it's not what we do. It's what he did. We should have our focus on Jesus Christ, praising him, giving all the glory to him for salvation. It's not anything we do. Um, and so that's the way I also look at those verses in Romans 3.10 through 3.12, and then in the Old Testament in Ecclesiastes 7.20. And then finally, I, I can't sum up Romans 4.25 any better than you did. And uh, I really learned a lot at the, well, I always learn a lot throughout these videos, but I uh, really um, learned a lot. That was great the, about that last 10 minutes on, on Romans 4.25. Uh, so, you know, for everybody watching uh, these videos are all about um, having put in our faith in Jesus Christ. It's not by works of righteousness we have done. It's according to his mercy. It's his grace through faith that we're saved. It's not of works. It's nothing that we do. Um, and hopefully this is just another installment in that series to uh, really point others uh, to Jesus Christ, depending on him, trusting in him, um, you know, resting in his finished work for salvation 
um, because that's what gives us confidence. That's what gives us assurance is knowing that he's our intercessor, he's our mediator, and he's done all the work. And he's resting now too. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. Um, you know, the work is complete. Um, he, it's a once and for all, and it's for all sins, past, present, and future for all men. Um, and we just need to come to God by him to receive this free gift of eternal life. Uh, so that's what sort of the message, uh, hopefully, that we can share throughout this uh, video series. Hmm. All right. Well, we certainly had our struggles getting this broadcast started today with the technical issues, but thank you, Jesus. It all, it all worked out. And I'm so glad now that uh, we don't have to use that ancient method of just having you on the telephone. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, to the viewers, um, if you have not seen all the videos in this series, 101 Verses Proving Faith Alone, um, uh, all the previous videos are on my playlist uh, on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preachers. I hope you will watch it from the beginning. And if you don't need to be convinced, I, I, I hope you'll share this playlist with someone who doesn't understand or agree with this. Um, so thank you all for watching. And brother, again, thank you for participating. It's a great joy working with you. So bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.